I have read front to back over 100 scientific studies. No abstracts, no summaries, no single highlights. Actually read and analyzed 100 full studies. It's been a fun ride, but above all, it's been incredibly informative and has taught me things that I wouldn't have learned otherwise, even in my PhD in molecular medicine. I was able to help someone close to me with their prediabetes. I gained some clarity on how plastics were impacting my health and discovered something intriguing about low carbohydrate diets, along with many other things. So I thought to myself, Nick, wouldn't this be a great video to make? To which I replied to myself, yes, yes, it would be a fine video, Nicholas. But that conversation happened inside my head. So really, it was just a few thousand neurons performing that conversation. Anyway, here are 10 among many things that I learned. One, FMD on health. I did some serious deep dives into fasting mimicking diets, FMD for short, and how they affect our health. Fun fact, some of my very first uh, deep dive study analyses were on these studies, and then I redid these analyses recently. If you aren't familiar, a fasting mimicking diet is a low calorie diet that, unsurprisingly, mimics fasting. Ultimately, I learned that doing an FMD just once a month led to improved body weight, reduced blood sugar, improved inflammatory markers, blood pressure, and much more. Overall, the effects were present in normal weight, otherwise metabolically healthy individuals, evidenced here with blood sugar reduction of 10 to 11%. But the effect was greater in overweight and metabolically unhealthy individuals, with wider reaching results, including reduced triglycerides, cholesterol, and other metrics, as seen here. People with higher triglycerides experience reductions, and those with high LDL cholesterol experience significant reductions. All that from doing a five days of FMD every month. Pretty incredible. Now, if you want to learn more, I have videos, video series on the topic, so you can check those out. Two, autophagy protects the liver. Something of which I wasn't aware, even having performed studies in autophagy, was that autophagy protects our liver. Autophagy is a cellular cleanup system. It is self-eating machinery in the cells known as autophagosomes that capture and destroy elements targeted for degradation. However, in the liver, autophagy also helps manage fat overload. You may have heard of non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Well, autophagy protects against accumulations of fat molecules stored as lipid droplets within our cells by gobbling them up and liberating them. This process is called lipophagy. I covered that when discussing a scientific review that covers how fasting induces autophagy in various organ systems. The videos didn't do so well, so I only produced two or three when I planned on covering the heart, muscles, kidneys, and other organs. But if you're interested in learning more, I'll link them for you regardless. Three. Sucralose has an, a mild insulin resistance effect. This was by far my most frustrating investigation I've ever done. That might be evidenced by the fact that 13% of the studies that I read were dedicated to this topic. Uh, I was joking with my dad who was kind enough to listen to me rant about how confusing the data was, that it was no wonder there are no meta-analyses on this topic meaning the gold standard of scientific investigation, which pools all the studies on a subject like sucralose and applies statistical analyses to the sum of the data to come to a conclusion. The reason, in my estimation, is because the studies are absolutely wildly all over the place. I remember reading a scientific review, which is far less rigorous, and the researchers just threw up their hands and said something along the lines of, it's probably because of different experimental methods between studies, but I didn't buy it. There's more to this story that I mentioned for my Physionic Insiders, but there simply isn't enough data to come to a definitive conclusion as to why. Anyway, some studies show sucralose has no insulin resistance effect, and the others show a distinct insulin resistance effect. Ultimately, after analyzing 13 studies, 
I came to the conclusion that it'd be best to avoid sucralose because I felt that while the insulin resistance effect was probably mild, it was still likely present. Will it alone drive you into diabetes? No, almost none of the studies showed positive effects, so I'd opt for alternatives. Four, phthalates likely cause insulin resistance. This is one investigation I decided to pick up as a result of listening to a researcher, Dr. Shauna Swan, speak on the topic of phthalates and their testosterone effects. I haven't gotten around to looking at the research on testosterone, although I'd be happy to spend some time looking into it, assuming that there's interest. For familiarity, phthalates are a molecule used in a wide variety of materials, but most associated with plastic, like plastic bottles, containers, and so on. Ultimately, I decided to analyze three or four studies on the topic. I think I failed to release content on one of them, uh, mainly because it was hot garbage. Uh, although in the future, I'll release content on bad studies too, because I think it's important for the public to see why certain studies should be dismissed. Anyway, I did look into a few others, and it's difficult to come to a definitive conclusion because some of the studies are retrospective associative studies in humans, which fail to generate a cause and effect relationship, even if they show an association, like this one, shows that urine phthalate levels increase, insulin resistance, a heavy marker of diabetes, also increases. But that still doesn't create a cause and effect relationship. For that, I had to rely on animal studies where animals were exposed to phthalates. Universally, they showed negative effects like this one, showing slight increases in insulin resistance with a small dose and much larger doses leading to robust effects in mice. While it'd be lovely to get human randomized controlled trials on the topic to the point of this recording, there aren't any. But association plus preliminary cause and effect data indicates to me that phthalates are to be avoided. I've since switched to non-plastic containers for my liquids and never microwave plastics, among other small changes. Five, prioritize polyunsaturated fats over saturated for insulin resistance. You might have noticed that a lot of my work is in insulin resistance. I'd really love to cover far more topics than just insulin resistance, but insulin resistance is a huge problem in our society today. And until Physionic grows to a size where I can employ others, I'm limited on the speed of my analyses. Still, I am quite proud of this one as well, although it has also generated the most hate and backlash thrust my direction. But I have yet to run across any convincing evidence that eliminates my conclusions here. I analyzed 10 studies plus a meta-analysis of 99 studies for my Physionic Insiders, and all the studies strongly point that between two dietary fats, saturated and polyunsaturated, polyunsaturated fats are preferable in measures of insulin resistance. As one example, from the 99-study meta-analysis, the researchers indicated that if polyunsaturated fats replaced saturated fats, there were greater reductions in blood sugar, indicated by the pool data, the black diamond moving to the left, and the confidence intervals being firmly planted to the left, all of which indicates lower blood sugar. Still, I recognize there are different types of saturated fat and polyunsaturated fat, so there may be some nuances that I'm missing here, and I expect to continue delving into some of those details in the future, which may provide some added context that I can't provide right now. However, for now, generally speaking, opting for more polyunsaturated fats over saturated fats seems to have strong evidence in its favor. Six, curcumin reduces diabetes risk. Continuing with our theme of diabetes and insulin resistance, I was especially curious about supplementing curcumin to help lower blood sugar and insulin, as well as general indices of insulin resistance. I performed a 10-study analysis, including a 12-study meta-analysis and a 16-study systematic review to determine the role curcumin can play in our metabolic health. I broke it up into three groups. One, people with healthy blood sugar levels, two, people who are pre-diabetic, and three, people who are diabetic. I found that people who have normal blood sugar levels do not benefit from curcumin. 
pre-diabetic individuals experience benefits from curcumin as evidenced in one of several studies. Over nine months of curcumin consumption, there were reductions in insulin resistance compared to people who did not consume curcumin. Then diabetics, although I also found some errors in the meta-analysis I mentioned, uh, I ultimately also concluded that curcumin helps reduce insulin resistance. Again, for my Physionic Insiders, I mentioned a few different ways to consume curcumin for maximum effectiveness, but I also released a public video discussing the consumption with piperin, which I'll link to this video for you if you're interested. Like I mentioned earlier, this was convincing enough evidence for me to mention it to, as a therapy for someone close to me. Obviously, I'm not a physician, nor theirs, so anyone that decides to use it should talk to their doctor, but it might be worth it for you if you have a history of diabetes for more reasons than just what I've shown here. I'll leave it at that. Seven, Tonkat Ali, an overblown testosterone booster. I read every study to date on Tonkat Ali, which is an herbal supplement touted to increase testosterone. There are only five or six studies on the topic, but it includes a meta-analysis of five studies. Unfortunately, many internet personalities, including respected scientists, took the limited data that we have and made some bold claims about Tonkat Ali's effectiveness. However, after analyzing the available evidence, it seemed clear to me that Tonkat Ali does increase testosterone, but to a far lesser degree than people claim. As a matter of fact, it may have extremely mild to no effect in people with normal testosterone, and the main effect is driven by men with clinically low testosterone. What was funny was that even industry-funded studies showed no effect in certain populations, like this one. And those that showed the greatest effect were poorly controlled studies, like this one. Removing the Chan study essentially eliminated the meta-analysis conclusion there might be a mild testosterone increasing effect in men with clinically normal testosterone. This, among reasons mentioned in my full study analysis, is why Tongat Ali is effective, but the amount of effect, known as the effect size, is probably pretty minimal and slightly larger in those that have low testosterone. Eight, our microbiome influences inflammation, diabetes, and more. I read a scientific review that aimed to pull together all the relevant studies that we have on how the microbiome in our gut influences our health. Now, while the scientific review did include over 200 studies, this was not a meta-analysis, so there was no statistics applied to determine effects. Still, if we are to trust the researchers, which I tend to do, call me biased, I tend to trust people who dedicate their lives to an area of study, maybe I'm insane, there was a tremendous amount of information covered in this review, so I can't cover it all here, but I wanted to mention two key things. One, the bacteria, fungi, and general microbes found in our intestines take some of the nutrients that we consume and convert them into other molecules or metabolites. One example is the generation of short-chain fats, like butyrate, by these microbes, which then interacts with key organs like your liver, and tend to be associated with reduced inflammation, improved insulin sensitivity, or said differently, protecting against diabetes risk, and other wanted outcomes. Second, these microbes are depleted in overweight individuals, and one way to facilitate their growth is consuming adequate fiber in your diet. Like I said, a mountain more to cover here, but this video is already going to be long, so I have to move on. If you're interested, I have some additional content describing more specifics that I'll link for you. Nine, water fasting is an effective method of improving your health. I was fortunate enough to release a sizable amount of information on water fasting over this 100 study haul. Uh, I analyzed three studies wherein the researchers had people fast drinking only water and the requisite electrolytes. Additionally, I had the distinct pleasure of having Ron, a subscriber that I interviewed, on to discuss his 54-day water fasting journey. Between the interview and the studies, I learned quite a bit from water fasting's insulin, blood pressure, and cholesterol effects, which weren't exactly uniform across studies, but one thing was for sure people lost significant body weight, body fat, their blood pressure dropped, insulin dropped, glucose lowered, among many other effects. 
Generally, during the fast, insulin resistance seemed to improve, but after the fast, insulin resistance worsened. I speculate as to why that might be in my series on water fasting, which I will, you guessed it, link for you. Ultimately, I mentioned that water fasting is a great tool for rapidly improving one's health, but needs to be done properly. Uh, Ron did a wonderful job of this because he broke his fast slowly and introduced higher fat, lower carbohydrate foods initially, as well as implementing a one meal a day strategy to maintain his success. So water fasting can be done to great effect, but needs to be done correctly, preferably with supervision, and needs to have an exit nutrition plan that is more sustainable. 10. Ketogenic diets, positives and negatives. I read and analyzed 13 studies for this sucker. Uh, granted, not all of them were ketogenic or very low carb diets, but most of them were, with the exceptions probably being considered only low carbohydrate diets, with carbohydrate consumption being anywhere between 10 and 20% of nutrition. Those that were ketogenic, very low carbohydrate, tended to be 5% or less in carbohydrates. That said, almost universally, studies comparing very low carbohydrate diets versus higher carbohydrate diets showed a weight loss advantage for keto, very low carbohydrate diets. However, when calories were equated, measures of fat loss were the same, like what we see here. One of the advantages of a ketogenic diet may be the increased satiety, so people may be able to stick to their nutrition more easily by that mere fact alone. However, assuming fat loss is your goal and you do not have difficulty with adherence, a higher carbohydrate or a low carbohydrate diet will serve you equally well. If you have trouble with consuming carbohydrates, a low carbohydrate diet may have some added advantages for success, like improved satiety and avoiding certain hyper palatable foods. However, the specifics of a low carbohydrate diet matter. For example, in measures of cholesterol, total and LDL cholesterol tended to increase if the carbohydrates were replaced with saturated fat. Now, that may not happen if the carbohydrates are replaced with unsaturated fats or protein. The former seem to have some evidence pointing to it being true, but I expect to look into it in far more detail. Predictably, a low carbohydrate diet also reduces blood sugar and insulin levels, so it may have advantages in that regard too. The takeaway here is that across the mentioned metrics, a low carbohydrate diet can be used to great success, but for health reasons, you may want to avoid overfilling with saturated fats. I actually covered content on caffeine and heart health performance, ginseng on erectile dysfunction, mitochondrial dynamics, and much more, but I had to stop somewhere. However, if you want to check out any of the topics I mentioned in more detail, just click the attached links in the description box, and I am extremely excited for the next 100 studies. What will we learn about our body? Thanks for stopping by. Until next time.